World War I, the Battle of the Somme. It was one of the greatest offensives ever seen, and it would go on for months. But the day it all began, July the 1st, 1916, is remembered now as the British Army's blackest ever day. They've hardly got beyond their own barbed wire. Loads of them are dead and injured. It was absolutely crazy. I've always been fascinated by the story of this terrible battle. But first-hand accounts kept at the time are pretty scarce. So we have to piece together the story from the few bits of evidence we have. But luckily, I found a rare and very secret wartime diary. Now, thanks to this unique personal record smuggled back from the front, I'll reveal in intimate detail the dramatic story of one battalion from one British city in the words of one man, Private Frank Meakin. So he could have got into trouble. If oh, huge trouble. trouble. These were hot stuff. Frank and his comrades were part of a unique volunteer army, the Pals, who left their homes and their loved ones behind to go and fight. With the testimony in Frank's diary and with the help of historians and experts, we'll retrace their unique journey from the trenches where they trained to the trenches where they fought 100 years ago. They'd have fixed their bayonets at 7.20 in the morning, they would have gone over. As they faced the terrible first 24 hours on the Somme. By summer 1916, what would come to be called the Great War had been raging for almost two years. But on the Western Front, there was stalemate, with lines of trenches and barbed wire dividing Europe from north to south. With the casualty figures rising, both sides were desperate to make a breakthrough. The time had come for the Allies to make the big push. This shallow ditch on the edge of this wood was once part of the front line that ran north to south all the way across Western Europe. And on the 1st of July 1916, in this very trench, hundreds of British soldiers went up this parapet and out into no man's land. The majority of them would become casualties in the first few yards. Overall, 19,000 British troops would be dead by sunset. The first day of the Battle of the Somme had begun. Throughout that first dreadful day and during the weeks and months that followed, our secret diarist Frank Meakin served alongside hundreds of thousands of young men who joined up to fight for king and country. Can you imagine? There would have been hundreds of guys in their uniforms shuffling and pushing, trying to get in line. And then slowly, they began to move forward to their own barbed wire. And yet what makes it all the more remarkable to me is that Frank, like millions of others, had volunteered to go. Frank's road to the Somme began two years earlier, many miles away in the northern British city of Sheffield. In August 1914, Sheffield was a thriving place, its famous steel industry booming as production stepped up for the war. It was the armory of Britain. But the war effort needed more than weaponry. Lord Kitchener was building a new volunteer army, two and a half million men Many from the same city, town, street, even workplace signed up to fight. They became known as the Pals Battalions. At first, Sheffield didn't have its own Pals Battalion, and that caused quite a lot of fuss in the newspapers. Although in many ways it was understandable. Sheffield had already contributed hundreds of young men to the old York and Lanks regiments. 
that's its memorial there. And it needed to hold on to a lot of its skilled young men in order to keep working in the munitions and steel industry. But it was perceived that something had to be done. And it was in those red brick buildings over there, which are part of Sheffield's university, that a couple of guys in the officer training corps came up with an idea to bring Sheffield's professional classes into the war. By this, they meant office workers, clerks, businessmen, as opposed to manual workers, of which most other PALS units were comprised. It was the Sheffield City Battalion, and Frank Meakin wanted to be part of it. On the afternoon of September the 2nd, 1914, a great crowd gathered here outside Sheffield Town Hall. They were here to watch hundreds of volunteers arrive here and sign up. They came from all parts of Sheffield and beyond, all walks of life, all encouraged by the Duke of Norfolk himself, who's still here on the very staircase that they all filed up. 1,500 forms had been printed specially, and it was right here in the council chamber that Frank, along with a group of friends and colleagues, signed their names. None of them knew what lay in store. But 100 years on, we do know in detail, thanks to Frank's diary. A diary that shouldn't have existed because keeping one was forbidden for servicemen on active duty on the Western Front. 34-year-old Frank Meakin worked as an architect actually in the town hall. In the days, the catchment was broadened to include men from the surrounding areas like John William Streets, the eldest son from a Methodist family in Whitwell, Derbyshire. He was self-educated, studying in his spare time while working down the pits to help support his family. Frank and the other volunteers barely had time to reflect before they were ordered to report for the battalion's first parade. A hundred years ago, this wasn't a fancy car showroom. It had a completely different function, as you can see from some of the evidence on the walls. Norfolk Barracks had been the headquarters of some of the local territorials before the war. On the 14th of September 1914, the city battalion guys, nearly a thousand of them, all crowded in here, waiting to start the process of becoming soldiers. And you can imagine what it would have been like. They would have known nothing. They would have been edging around, milling about, laughing, cracking gags, being nervous until eventually some old sweats who'd been in the army before would start pulling them together into makeshift companies. But these were people who'd been at school together, been at work together, were in the same family. They didn't want just to be in the same companies, they wanted to be in the same platoons and the same sections, which is why the Battle of the Somme had such a terrifying impact on society. Because all those guys who'd been together for so long were still together now when the fighting began and the slaughter started. Move! Move! The men of the Sheffield Battalion couldn't have imagined the horrors they'd face on the first day on the Somme. That was still almost two years in the future. Now, after joining up, came the bane of all new army recruits. Before they could hold a rifle or even wear a uniform, the new city battalion had to learn drill. And there was only one place nearby that was big enough for that. I used to come here to away matches when I was in my teens. This is Bramall Lane, the home of Sheffield United Football Club. And when I knew this place, it didn't look like this. That stand was there and that stand was and this stand but over here there was nothing well I'll say there was nothing there was a cricket pitch stretching way 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 back and beyond it there was a cricket pavilion and uh, the local people loved it they used to come here sit in the stand watch all the guys marching around applauding well at least they did for a bit but after a while everyone got really bored with that and uh, as you can imagine, the groundsmen got pretty hacked off as well, seeing their lovely grass being ripped to shreds. And so the battalion had to find somewhere else to do their marching. The weeks of square bashing had made the guys fitter. 
And that came in handy because their new barracks weren't actually in Sheffield, but up on the moors outside the city. And it was December. And the day they had to march there, it snowed. Redmire's camp was so new, in fact, that it wasn't actually finished. The lads were put to work as soon as they arrived, building huts and laying gravel paths. And if that wasn't bad enough, there was also field training and route marches in full equipment across the moors. It was a bit of a remote spot, but fortunately, there were some benefits. The lads arrived here at this time of year in exactly this kind of weather. You'd have thought life would have been hell on wheels, but there was this pub and another one just down the road that they could sneak off to. They could get home at weekends. By all accounts, they had a pretty good time of it. There you go, Helen. Thank you. There was a name, was that like uh, a, a pie and something men that they were called? Uh, but... Coffee and bun men. Oh, coffee and bun <laughs> men, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was because everybody thought they were having such a good time. Helen Allathorne has been researching this area for 20 years, and she's well acquainted with the harsh conditions here in winter. The coffee and bun boys back then might not have agreed, but this had its uses. Given what was going to happen to them in the not-too-distant future, they really did need to be toughened up in weather like this, didn't they? They certainly did, and they, they certainly have a, had a baptism by fire, almost, by being up here, because it's very high up here, very exposed. There is no tree cover where they were training. We know from the accounts that, that it was very bad weather, so not only wind and rain like we have today, but also snow as well that they had to contend with. The huts and gravel paths built by the guys are now long gone. In the early 1990s, though, archaeologist Helen discovered other remains of this area's military past, which had lain forgotten for many decades. I was taking some students out from the University of Sheffield and we were doing landscape recording. And we came across these features that nobody knew what they were until we started doing a bit more uh, research and we discovered that these were actually rather rare First World War practice trenches. Amazingly, the trenches Helen found were actually dug by the city battalion men during the winter of 1914-15. They were to get the guys used to the kind of positions they'd find themselves in in action. Unique evidence of the battalion's training, a monument in a way to guys who very soon afterwards were heading to the trenches for real. It's thanks to the Sheffield City Battalion that we've got some crucial historical detail, not only about the first 24 hours on the Somme, but also about life at Red Myers beforehand. Much of what we know comes from the others who kept diaries. One of these was written by young private Alf Casey. His diary came to light after a house clearance a few years ago. It gives an amazing insight into life for the recruits that winter. Monday the 4th of January, 1915. The rain, it raineth every day. Slush and sleet, rifles inspected, physical exercises in hut, one and a half mile run, drill with rifle in closed formation. Dinner rather poor for a Route surprise. Rise, 9 to 2.30 p.m. over Roper's Hill, ringing low, over at Moors, down to town, past Drill Hall to Norfolk Park, back to Midland Station, back to Red Myers. After almost five months of hard training, it was time for the battalion to leave Red Myers and Sheffield. For Frank Meakin, Alf Casey, Reg Glenn, William Colley and Will Streets, the drilling and the exercises were over. It was time to go to war. This was the moment Frank Meakin started keeping his diary. But his detailed account of events leading up to the Somme remained lost, unread with his family, until they were discovered by Penny Meakin, who's been enthralled by Frank's story ever since. So these are actually Frank's diaries? These are Frank Meakin's diaries. How did you get hold of them? They were in my husband's family for 80 years. Was he related to Frank? Frank was his grandfather. In four volumes, they're the most complete personal diaries that remain from the city battalion. How long did it take you to decipher the, the lot of them? About 20 years. <laughs> no, no, on and off. 
Frank's diary is a raw and honest personal record of events as he saw them. His views sometimes conflicted with the official story. They were not allowed to keep diaries during active service. Now, Frank was quite a rebel. I can, I can tell that from what he writes in the diaries. And I don't think it's any coincidence that he started these diaries on the first day of active service. What sort of things do they say that make you think he was a rebel? Uh, making comments about what's going on, um, you know, perhaps it shouldn't have happened like that. Oh, really? So he could have got into trouble if he Oh, huge been trouble. I mean, for keeping the diaries alone. I mean, yes, these were, these were hot stuff. Frank certainly didn't hold back from describing the harsh realities. April the 26th, 1916. The idea of wasting valuable years of one's short life at this game and being treated like beasts shows that we've truly sold our birthright. He had his own circle of friends, didn't he, in the trenches? He did. Most of them he worked with in the town hall in Sheffield before they signed up. And they all signed up together. They all signed up on the first day. Trained together, fought together. Being in his mid-thirties, Frank got along well with some of the older guys in the battalion who were officers and sergeants, including Will Colley and an experienced man named William Marsden, who'd been made a company sergeant major. More of him a little later. In early March 1916, they got wind that something was up. Friday, March the 3rd, 1916. There are strong rumours of moving at last. The finest rumour so far is that the battalion to have six days leave immediately after arrival in France. In April 1916, the Sheffield Battalion arrived on the Somme. Thousands of British and Commonwealth troops were being massed along the Somme front ready for the big push. The idea was for more than 20 PALS battalions, thousands of men, to attack the German lines and break through to the open country beyond. Everyone knew it was coming, even the Germans. The Sheffields formed part of the 94th Brigade in the new and entirely northern 31st Division. Appropriately enough, they were deployed to the northernmost part of the whole front, the extreme left of the British attack. They and the other battalions of the 94th came to know this area of the trenches all too well. Down here, you can see the only area of British trenches that survived after the Battle of the Somme. Look, can you see this little dip here? That was one of the trenches. And this place was bought by the city of Sheffield after the war to honour the men of the city battalion and also all the other battalions of the 94th who fought here on the 1st of July. Throughout May and June 1916, the guys served several tours in the line here. It was their introduction to trench life. Do we know much about what his life was like when they first arrived at the trenches? They arrive at the trenches and I think it's a bit of a, a rude awakening. And the conditions in the trenches are appalling, absolutely appalling. He writes of being covered in lice. He talks of rats running over them. Um, he talks of not having a, a, a shower or a bath for weeks. Like all soldiers, food was a constant obsession, but Frank had more reason for this than most. The whole set of diaries, every day he starts with what he had for breakfast, what he had for dinner, what he had for tea. Because he had diabetes, he had to eat little and often. Breakfast, bacon, dinner, Hot meat and raisin duck, fully beef. Dates, a few, and no jam or butter. The conditions are dreadful, but Frank, the most important thing to Frank, food. <laughs> Will he get his food on time? Um, and you think that rather than it just, he liked food or being greedy, that was about managing an illness? That was managing the illness as well as the conditions, the food, and a debilitating illness, Frank and the others had something else to deal with now. The Germans sniped them, raided them, and shelled them. And the layout of the trenches they were in didn't help. This was the lad's first experience of the 
brutality of war and a really hard lesson in trench warfare. These trenches had been dug by the Germans who'd then retreated and had been taken over by the Brits. Now that meant that their entrances were facing this way towards the Germans whereas if they'd originally been dug by the Brits everything would have been the other way round and the entrances would have been there covered by the rest of the British line. So the guys here are incredibly vulnerable. Not only that but the Germans know the whole geography of the trenches because they dug them. On June the 17th, Frank Meekin's friend Sergeant Marsden was caught in a sudden German barrage. So on this particular day in the run-up to the battle, Sergeant Marsden and a bunch of other guys are in a dugout. They've been shot up during the course of the day. They're waiting for first aid and evacuation and they think they're perfectly safe when wham! A Meinenwerfer goes straight in through the entranceway. The rest of the guys get out. Sergeant Marsden doesn't. That was a very, very difficult day. Frank was guarding his post. And there was terrible bombardment. And so many people were killed, including a lot of his pals. And I think that's when the realisation really set in that this really was horrible. Suddenly it was all very different from the coffee and bun days at Redmire's. This was war. Frank and his pals just had to push on. On the first day of the Battle of the Somme, the Sheffield Battalion's mission was to attack a stronghold near a village called Serre. If you blinked, you'd miss this place. It's just a few houses and farm buildings scattered along the main road. But in 1916, this was strategically incredibly important. It was a virtual fortress. It was ringed by four concentric circles of trenches. And even though virtually every house was smashed to bits, every one of them was a strong point or a command post or a dugout. Before the attack, the plan was for the British artillery to fire a week-long barrage, more than a million shells, aimed at destroying the German barbed wire defences. For days, the lads listened to the incessant fire of their own guns, while the rain hammered down, turning the trenches into mires. Finally, it was time. On the 30th of June, they began moving into attack positions in the frontline trenches. Zero hour was 0730 the following morning, the 1st of July 1916. The first 24 hours of the Battle of the Somme are about to begin. When the battalion were first heading to their trenches, this is the route that they would have gone down, only this was a communication trench back then. And this is the view that they would have had, although it wouldn't have been one long wood in those days. It was four discrete copses, which they called Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And it was to that end, to Luke and John, that the Sheffields were going. I'm meeting Paul Oldfield, a retired army officer who's extensively researched the history of the Sheffield Battalion on the Somme. It's pretty horrible today, isn't it? It's cold, it's wet, it's claggy underfoot. Would it have been like that? No, the weather on the uh, 30th of June, 1st of July was actually pretty good. Um, the, the days before the attack, uh, there'd been very, very heavy rain, and as a result, all this thick, glutinous mud had formed on the bottom of the communication trenches, uh, making life pretty miserable for the guys and, and slowing things down. Where would uh, they have come from? Uh, well, they started off uh, the night before the attack, about five or six miles back. Uh, they'd had billets in a wood, um, started moving forward um, early evening, about 7.30. But later on, uh, they had a final halt for some tea and rum uh, and, and take some rations. Um, at that point then, uh, they had to go into the trenches. So the last two miles of this journey were, were in communication trenches. What must it have been like for them moving around that night? It was dark, uh, they had to keep quiet, they, there was no light showing. Uh, there was lots of flashes of shells going over the top of them. Um, very atmospheric, very tense. And of course, the bottom of the trenches were, were, were thick in mud. How many guys do you reckon would have been here? Uh, well, this, th in this brigade area, yeah. probably about 4,000 guys all trying to get to their positions at the same time. Uh, all on a timetable, of course, so it was well worked out. 
Uh, but despite that, uh, the ground conditions were such that most of them were, were two or three hours late actually getting into position. From Red Myers, where the men first set foot in the trench, to here, where many of them would leave trenches for the last time, they were now almost in position. Paul and I search for the actual place where the city battalion went over the top in the first moments of the Somme. This is called the Sheffield Memorial Park, but were the Sheffields actually here on the first day of the Somme? No, they weren't. Um, they may have been here uh, during an earlier tour in the trenches, but th this area was occupied by another battalion. There were four copses here in 1916, and over the years they've all joined up into one. Uh, the Sheffield City Battalion was about another 200 metres this way, Tony, uh, through that thick undergrowth. So who was here? Uh, the Accrington Pals were here. The famous Accrington Pals? Absolutely, 11th East Lancashire, yeah. So to find out where the Sheffields are, we're going to have to get through this barbed wire and head off in that direction. I'm afraid so. Uh, right. Do you want to hold it open for me? Yeah, OK, here you go. From now on, we're walking in the footsteps of the Sheffield men. John Copps is littered with the remains of trenches and other features. It's always been under tree cover and so has never been ploughed or built over. The undulations and bumps are all that's left of what would have been a complicated trench system. And the Sheffield men had to find their way around it in the pitch dark. This area was never properly cleared after the war. It's no more dangerous than any other frontline land on the Somme battlefields, but it's on private land, and we were granted special access to explore here. Among and beneath the trenches, there would have been lots of dugouts and shelters, like the one Sergeant Marsden was trapped in. It's all lasting evidence of the city battalion's experiences here on the Somme. See that depression? On your left. Well, this one here. Do you have any idea what that might be? It could well be the uh, remains of, of a collapsed dugout, uh, perhaps even what, one of the uh, command posts that were established here. Do we know where we are in relation to well, the fighting that was going on? We're now just inside John Copps. Luke Copps is over that way, yeah. and the remainder of John Copps is over here. So, so you're right in the middle of the, the city battalion's position here. Exhausted from the long night, the guys waited ready for the off. With Paul's help, I'm finally at the edge of the overgrown wood where you can just about make out the Sheffield's actual front line trench. So that's John Copps, right? That's right, yep. And that's Luke Copps. Luke Copps over there, yep. So where we are now in this depression is exactly the front line where the city battalion would have been on that night. Uh, exactly. I mean, even after a century, it's still pretty apparent, almost still uh, uh, about a metre deep. Um, very well preserved, apart from all this vegetation, of course. And it would have been from here that they would have gone over the top. Let's fix bayonets. They'd have fixed their bayonets, 7.20 in the morning, they would have gone over and set themselves up on their start line, ready for the attack to start at 7.30. There they all were, ready to go. Frank Meakin, Alf Casey, Reg Glenn, Will Colley, and Will Streets, for whom fate had something special marked down, as we shall see later. Five men about to go into battle. How many would return? At 7.20 a.m., the City Battalion boys are ordered to get on their ladders, get up onto the parapets. The idea was that when the off was given 10 minutes later, they'd already be up here and could go straight forward without worrying about getting their webbing tangled on their ladders or whatever. The first wave was made up of A and C companies. B and D were timed to leave minutes later, a couple of hundred yards or so behind. The barbed wire was somewhere around here, and of course it wasn't all cut, there were just tiny little corridors in it. So you can imagine all these guys coming here, they're now having to shuffle through these corridors. And it was a bright morning, and the Germans are only about there, so they really are sitting ducks. 
the order is given that they should all lie down. They lie there doing nothing for around about eight minutes and the Germans are firing small arms, bursts from their machine guns, heavy artillery. It was horrible. So even when they've hardly got beyond their own barbed wire, loads of them are dead and injured. It was absolutely crazy. For eight whole minutes, they had to lie there under fire. Then at last, they were ordered to stand up and move forward. I don't know if you can see it, but this isn't flat ground. It's a, it's a slope, it's a hill. And the German front line was just on the lip there. So if you got a rifle and you were firing, towards the city battalion, you wouldn't have had to be the greatest marksman in the world to hit someone, would you? Not only that, but remember, this is the far northern end of the line, so the German flank is here, and they've got machine guns, they're firing into the city battalion. If you miss the first guy, you're likely to hit the person behind them or the person in front of them. So as you can imagine, all the guys are veering off in this direction to avoid this murderous fire. I can prove to you just how crazy it must have been here on that day. Look, I've just walked up, what, less than 100 yards and I've already picked up all that stuff, and really, I've got no eye for this sort of thing. I, that looks to me like a bit of a mortar shell. Imagine the scream you'd let out if you were hit by one of those. I can chuck that stuff away, because quite frankly, there's so much of it here. All they could do was hope the artillery had done its job to open the way forward. The German wire would have been about here somewhere, but when they got there, what did they find? It hadn't been cut. Even though there'd been a massive bombardment, it hadn't harmed the wire at all. The German wire was thicker than the British wire. So imagine what a state they would have been in now. They've got all this machine gun fire coming at them from over here. They've got these small arms being fired at them from over here. They can't move any further this way. They're not even allowed to go back towards their own line. How would you have felt in that kind of situation? The first day on the Battle of the Somme was just minutes old, and already the Sheffield's attack on Serre had broken down. It was chaos. What happened next, no one really knows. It all gets very hazy. This is partly because battalion headquarters over in John Copps was getting so little information, but also because most of the people who were on this field died on this field. So we have to piece together the story from the few bits of evidence we have. Of our characters who took part in the Battle of the Somme, all but one left that frontline trench on the 1st of July 1916. The exception was Reg Glenn. As one of the last remaining signalers, he was too important to risk. He'd spent the first part of the battle in the headquarters dugout, though he'd wanted to join the action with his comrades. 47-year-old Captain William Colley had led his men since Redmires. Someone asked him the correct time in the last few minutes before zero. Most time. Just before his company went over into no man's land. Let's fix bayonets. Case's later diaries were lost, or he simply never wrote any more on active service. Whatever the truth, he went over the top and was killed. He was never found. Few men survived the opening minutes unscathed, and certainly no one from headquarters was there to describe events for the war diary. So then we owe a great deal to the battalion's other diarist. Somehow, the 35-year-old architect survived. Not only that, 
He made it further than almost anyone else. Got a time? It was Frank Meakin who asked Collie the time, maybe to try and distract him for a few moments. Let's fix peanuts. Frank Meakin said that on the long trudge up to the German line, he could see his mates on either side of him covered in blood, but it never occurred to him for one moment that he would die. He just wanted to get on with the job. When the barrage lifted, the first wave went forward. I closed up and joined them. I stumbled several times in our barbed wire and cursed freely, but probably these stumbles saved my life time after time. Eventually, he gets to the German line, can't get through, but then about 40 yards away, he can see an area where half of the wire had been blown away, but only half of it. So there was enough there for him to get snug in and be firing towards the Germans who he could just see through the rest of the wire. The Germans were right on top of the parapet, behind the wire. They even brought up a machine gun there to face us. We made good rifle practice for a time, counting for several of them, until they took more careful cover. Frank and the others kept up this close-range fight until they couldn't hold on any longer. The other guys are saying, let's get out of here, let's go back to our line. He's saying, no, no, that would be crazy. We've got to wait until it's dark. Some of them decide to go back, some of them are hit, others of them come back and take cover by the barbed wire again, until eventually, Frank thinks it's safe enough to go back. He goes back across no man's land and he, he hops from one crater hole to the next, sprinting, ducking down, sprinting, ducking down, zigzagging this way and that until finally, just before he gets back to his own line, the whole area is thick with bodies, thick with injured, he helps patch some of them up, drags a few back into the trench. He gets into the trench himself, and that's the end of his first day. For miles along the British lines, it was the same story. A few breakthroughs in these first few hours, but mostly the attack stalled with terrible casualties. The fighting went on for hours. There was a little lull at one time when the Germans allowed the British to clear their dead and injured away, but then the British started shelling the Germans, the Germans retaliated and the whole thing kicked off again till eventually virtually the whole brigade had been wiped out and their bodies lay where they fell for months until finally they were buried in one of the little cemeteries dotted around the battlefield. The Sheffield's objective, the village of Serre, remained held by the Germans until they withdrew the following year. Frank and his pals never reached the village. But in 1923, the residents donated ground for a memorial to the men who died. Private Alf Casey and Captain William Colley and others are commemorated on the memorial to the missing at Teepval. Reg Glenn saw out the war. Over the years, he was a regular face at reunions until the final one in 1976. He was the last survivor of the original Red Myers men when he died in 1994, 101 years old. Late on this first day of the Somme, Sergeant Will Streets had led his men from the front. He was on his way back into John Copps. Sergeant Streets was wounded and made his way back to the comparative safety of his trench, but before he got there, he was told that some particular guy was injured and needed help. So, got another one down there. Sergeant Streets turned around and went back to assist him and was never seen again. 
John William Streets is believed to be buried near John Copps, where he died. A book of his poetry was published posthumously in 1919. Frank Meakin, too, survived the rest of the war and returned home to his wife, Doll, in Sheffield. Their grandson, Nick Meakin, is Penny's husband. Nick, what happened to your granddad after the war? He returned to Sheffield, to live in Sheffield, uh, resumed his career at the town hall. God, that must have been hard for him, must not it? I can't imagine <laughs> to enlist with all of your pals to go off and fight and then come back and do the same job that you had before. With so many of them gone. Absolutely, and, and now he would have uh, probably about half a dozen great-grandchildren as well. So uh, were it not for his stumbles and the bullets missing him, um, none of us would be here, of course. When the butcher's bill was finally confirmed, the true scale of what had happened over the first 24 hours on the Somme hit home. 19,000 were killed, most of them probably in the first few hours. The Sheffield City Battalion alone suffered 248 officers and men killed and 450 missing, wounded, or who subsequently died of wounds, all as a result of the attack on the 1st of July. The Germans up against all the battalions of the British 31st Division, lost just 365 killed, wounded and missing. All the city battalion men who were killed in the first 24 hours are still there on the Somme. Coming up next, freedom is on the line as a wager is made that will determine George's fate. Stay tuned for part three of the critically acclaimed Roots.